I think the real reason that the stocks haven't started working yet is that these companies have been so marginalized and their weight in the indices is so small that investors don't need to have anybody on staff who knows anything about this stuff. You know, and if you listen to Jeff Curry, who's Goldman Sachs commodity analyst, who actually is the last man standing still around, um, you know, he, he tell you he thinks that the mining weight within the S&P is going to triple or quadruple. And, and I would say I, I agree with that. I think that copper issue is, a, is going to be a, a big, big uh, uh, player uh, going forward. Uh, I would say even more than what we're seeing with lithium right now. Lithium is having its day right now, but I think that the story, the big story is copper. You're going to zoom past that stimulus price to a panic price or a pain point, and then you'll settle back at what is a reasonable investment level. We're very privileged to get to invest in, in a, at a point in time and in a part of the space where it's almost kind of valuation, valuation agnostic because it's just that everything is very cheap. And so it's about finding the best projects at that stage and then putting capital to work. Let's talk about some of these um, structural changes that we've got going on across commodities markets that very much play into the equities as well. And let's start with the macro picture, I think, just to frame, uh, frame today as well. Um, we've got a myriad of challenges out there, decelerating industri industrial growth, high interest rates, hawkish Fed, the war in Europe, um, all kinds of supply chain challenges, bailouts in the banking sector and, and, and in certain, certain areas of banking as well. Um, so are we in this perfect storm uh, for investing and um, what's keeping you up most at, at the moment in terms of the macro outlook? Um, Justin, why don't we start with yourself and we can work our way down. Perfect. Uh, and thanks, Adam. So I'll start with the intro. So my name is Justin Machen. I'm a managing director at Denim Capital. Um, we are a mining focused private equity firm. Um, and, and where we specialize and, and focus our efforts is in late stage development and construction. Um, so we are equity focused investors and we provide construction capital to mining companies to help move their projects um, from being projects into, into becoming mines. Um, so that's where Denim focuses. Um, our, our approach is global. We invest in places as benign as British Columbia and as exciting as the DRC in Indonesia. Um, typical check size for us is about $100 million. And then we we really pride ourselves on on digging deep into different metals and minerals. And so again, we're in things as straight down the fairway as copper, and and as interesting as tin, rare earths, and calcium carbonate. Um, so that's a little bit about us. Um, and then as far as the the overriding kind of macro, I think Adam, you hit it on the head. There's certainly a thing that we're thinking the most about right now is just is challenges in the banking sector um, with everything that's happened with Credit Suisse and Silicon Valley Bank. You know, we're waiting to see is there is there another shoe that's going to drop here. Um, I think you know there's been some pretty strong policy moves to shore things up and, and to ensure that we're not going to see mass contagion. But but that's certainly a concern in the short short term. And and the people who park their capital with us, mm. um, that's a real concern for them. Mm. So that's where we're we're very focused. Um, and then additionally, I think you know another key theme that's really impacting the mining sector right now is inflation. Um, and so the policymakers have a really difficult decision right now. You know, do they keep raising rates to tame inflation and potentially cause more harm to the global economy, um, or, or do they start kind of slowing down rate increases to, to you know, kind of keep things propped up and, and ensure that markets are performing well? So, so these are some some of the interesting things going on right now. Yeah, absolutely, excellent. We'll delve into those in a little bit more detail as well and get the panels view on that. Roger, may I turn to you and please introduce yourself? First time with one to one coming to speak for us. Um, thank you for that as well. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know if that's on. Maybe. Thanks, Adam. Uh, I'm Roger Mortimer uh, with Crane Chairs. I manage a global energy transition fund. We invest in equities that benefit from the transition from what I'm going to call gray to green. Uh, and our thesis, which wouldn't sit well with an ESG investor, is the greatest opportunity is actually in the companies that are dirtiest today. So 90 companies account for two thirds of global emissions, and you can't solve the problem without these companies. And these companies are actually better placed to step into these new businesses uh, than many, many are because they have global infrastructure, they have technology, they have global customer bases. And our investment thesis is predicated on the change in investor perception that's going to occur as these uh, large companies are revealed to have all kinds of skills that people didn't expect them to have. 
Um, so maybe, maybe l- let me talk about the macro. I've been a global equity investor for 25 years. And um, I'm a public equity investor. I'm marked to market every day, uh, whereas uh, Justin is not. He can afford to have his marks go way offside for periods of time. And for a marked to market investor, the current environment's extraordinarily difficult. Um, because you have a lot of short-term volatility. There are a lot of very negative factors. And broadly speaking, as it relates to metals, you're trading off a coming super cycle in investment that's going to increase demand for all this stuff against short-term factors that are extremely disruptive. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, the prices of commodities like copper are still influenced by coincident consumption. And, and so the point that's most important to take away is that interest rates have essentially fallen for 40 years for the duration of the careers of virtually everybody in this room, and they're not falling anymore. And they're not going to fall again. And uh, what that means is that we've been, as investors, we've been operating with a tailwind that we didn't realize that we had, but we're starting to notice it now that it's a headwind. And um, the contributors to inflation are numerous, and they're going to be persistent. Inflation is not going to go away. Interest rates are not going to go down. Interest rates are going to remain structurally high for a very long period of time. And that reduces liquidity and available capital for investment and makes everything more difficult, right? So uh, commodity and energy inflation is a function of underinvestment. The companies have been lectured by shareholders over the last 10 years to return capital instead of putting it back into the ground. So um, the cupboard is bare. There's no project development coming in some of these commodities. Uh, it takes five or six years to get something going. Uh, food price inflation is a function of energy price inflation. You have to drive a tractor and make fertilizer with natural gas uh, to to grow crops. Uh, and so that that's a feedback loop. Uh, labor productivity in 2022 in the United States fell by the largest number ever. So now you have labor price inflation because nobody wants to go to work anymore. Um, and then you have inflation that is caused by government policy, restrictive policies around high emitting areas, carbon taxes, increase the effective cost of these businesses. Um, and um, then then you have banking crises, which are liquidity constraining events. And, and so the sum of all of these is, uh, unless you believe that the Fed is going to throw in the towel and, and drop interest rates, um, then I think you should operate on the assumption that inflation is going to be persistent. And the Fed is going to try to walk this very difficult line between maintaining confidence in the financial system and solving papering over problems as they pop up. Um, uh, and uh, addre- address the underlying inflation issue. And I just say one thing is, if the Fed folds and cuts rates, the US dollar is going to sink like a rock, and you can buy any commodity you want because they're all going to be repriced in US dollars. Yep. And what do you think the Fed's going to do? Uh, crystal ball. Um, are they going to keep hawkish stance? Me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. I, I, think, the, I think the Fed... Um, the Fed has interpreted its primary mandate as inflation reduction mm. and financial stability, I think, is going to become an issue. I live in San Francisco. First Republic is a very, very stable, well-run bank that has been caught up in the Silicon Valley um, bank failure. And what it shows you is that the market can force things to happen and th- those that can be very unpredictable. So the Fed's going to have to find a way to paper these issues over, but I don't think they're going to just uh, just fold and give the market what it wants. Yep. Okay, so buckle up. Okay, uh, Keith, let's get your take on the macro, and please, of, of course, introduce yourself. Okay, you're fine. Uh, I, I'm Keith Spence, and I'm uh, head of Global Mine and Capital. It's a private equity firm. Uh, for the last uh, twenty years or so, most of our activities have been in Asia, in particular China. So most of our fund funding and uh, most of the deals that we did were sort of Asia based. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, funding background, uh, we focus on late stage near development projects all over the world. Uh, we particularly like uh, Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, in the past, we went wherever our Chinese partners went. And what I want to talk about uh, in, in terms of the macro, it's the geopolitics of the world now and how it would affect mining, but also how it will affect uh, 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 most economies going forward. The world is divided into two polarities, one, the US, and what we, uh, you, uh, the five eyes countries, which is the US, Canada, Australia, uh, the EU, and uh, China, 
Russia and maybe Iran on one side, and then the emerging markets countries, mainly the BRICS countries, ex, ex China, uh, Africa, um, Latin America. The, it's the great game, who will have these countries? Where would their allegiance lie? India ex, uh, also, would, would it be uh, uh, a world where these countries are, uh, remain non-aligned? and uh, pick off from, the, from the, the big two blocks, or will they gradually move towards one or the other? And that means a lot for the mining space because the mining space is a global space. Uh, if you look at, for example, the, the Toronto Stock Exchange, which is the number one, is the NASDAQ for, for uh, the mining uh, industry. If you look at the stocks uh, that are listed there, some 60% of all the listings, especially on the venture exchange, are companies uh, with projects outside of Canada, outside of North America, uh, mainly in emerging markets, but also in uh, uh, developed markets in, in Europe. So if you're gonna have geopolitics, it's definitely gonna affect where uh, are we going to have expiration in some of these countries? Uh, just recently, the Canadian government, for example, um, banned uh, three uh, companies that uh, uh, lithium-related uh, companies and critical. We will, I guess, we'll talk a lot about the critical min minerals yep. space we'll later. But banned companies that that were in the in the critical mineral space. And uh, of, of these companies, one of them had projects outside of Canada, had nothing to do with Canada, except that it was listed in uh, uh, exchange in Canada. So the geopolitics, I would say, is the bigger, biggest uh, macro issue that we have to pay, uh, face. Yep, excellent. We'll delve into it. Um, Dan, please introduce yourself and thanks for joining us and speaking at one to one for the first time. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, name's Dan Denbo. So I, I've been in the space for quite some time. I was the uh, portfolio manager for the USA Precious Metals Fund. I was at USA for 23 years. Also ran a global dividend and a domestic dividend fund for them before they sold mutual funds in 21, I guess it was. To, uh, so I was running about $4 billion. I'm also a director on a private uh, Finnish company, exploration company, which everybody knows Finland's getting hot these days, and then also interim CEO and director on a Ontario uh, exploration company as well that hopefully one day will be here uh, giving presentations to you as well. Uh, and then, of course, I'm from Texas, so I do have a small oil and gas company, uh, but I don't have any cows at the moment, so <laughs> I'm only fulfilling half my uh, Texas uh, heritage there. Turns it, you know, global, just a couple of things to tie up on comments made. One, you know, I don't believe there is a banking crisis. I think what happened was the tide went out and we saw who didn't have their board shorts on. Um, they're just poorly run companies that had poor strategies and they got caught in the tide. Unfortunately, that has disrupted some other people and they're having to fix some things because they had a similar looking structure. But I don't think that there's going to be a major contagion, everybody runs to the last crisis and tries to make the last crisis this crisis, but every crisis is always different, unfortunately. And we all spend nights awake thinking about different things, but they're never what actually happens. It's what could happen. And then something different happens and you have to learn a new game. You reshuffle the cards and you move forward. But probably the hardest challenge is the geopolitics that everybody's talking about and what is happening because you're playing chess against several, seven or eight different components and they all have different rules in the game. They're playing a different game and they all have different interests. And so when you're trying to go into make a, an investment decision and you want to put, you know, billions of dollars into Chile or Argentina and their politics are one thing one night and then they're the another thing the next night and then they have an upheaval. It's hard to make those capital commitments. And then on top of that, you have the ESG pressure coming in on top of those investments. And your board is supposed to green light a six billion dollar investment that's going to take seven million or seven years to do before you see one you know drop of income come back in to replenish that. But you have no idea what's going to do the politics of the country 
what's going to happen to the ESG criteria and if your investors will still be there because pressure uh, from the ESG because you're supposedly the evildoer, even though you're trying to solve a problem by providing more copper or critical metals and things like that. So it is a very difficult time to operate. And then on the other end of it, you have the inflation and the labor inflation that's happening as well. And that's just going to grow because we're becoming more isolated. We saw from COVID, you have these supply chain issues. And now everybody wants to manufacture everything at home. And to do that, the amount of investment that's going to have to happen here in the U.S. and in other countries, or if we look at it more on the North American, you know, Mexico, Canada, U.S. basis to get that labor and get those plants built, the amount of capital that's going to have to go into that. And then what are you going to pay for that labor? We already have labor shortages in the U.S. You, you can't go to Starbucks and get a coffee because they're closed half the time because of a labor issue. Or, you know, a restaurant can only do the drive through. They can't do because they have labor issues. And now we're supposed to build all our chips here or build everything else here. But we can't even fill, we, we don't even have the task to fill a barista job, much less somebody that's going to run a manufacturing capability. So inflation is here, unfortunately. So I think the Fed is going to be fighting that battle a long time, but it's also going to be fighting politics. And you see, you know, they're having the banking hearings today on SVB. You're going to be fighting that pressure on the other side. And I'm glad I don't have Jerome Powell's job. He's not paid enough for the beating he's going to be taking from the left and the right. And so I think it's going to be a tough battle. And we'll see how strong he can be going through this. Yeah. That's a long winding path of that there's a lot happening. And for investors, it's very difficult. The one good thing I will say, for the first time in 20 years, investors are actually winning that they're beating the indexes. So being a money manager today is fraught with challenges, but also great opportunities because they're actually winning, because they're beating the index, because they're actually making better choices and they're choosing better stocks and you get good opportunities. We're gonna talk about price some opportunities where the mining space is definitely one where there's cheap, cheap opportunities. And you can't have Apple, can't have Tesla, can't have any of these other growth companies that it traded infinity without paying four times for a copper company in earnings. Copper companies, critical metals, whatever it is, they are also also growth companies. We have to convince everybody that we're not the evil company, that we actually are growth companies. Yep. Yeah, just on that same point with respect to copper, uh, it, the grades of, of copper is going down, down, down. I would say it's the most critical of all the, the minerals right now. There's not going to be any charging stations without copper. Mm. And if you look globally where the copper uh, comes from, uh, you know, the Congo, uh, there's lots of problems in Latin America. You know, Latin America is going left back to the old uh, 1960s and 70s, uh, yeah, Peru, Chile, Argentina. Uh, you just go through uh, Latin America. And, uh, you know, Chile is uh, the, the world's largest uh, supply of copper. And if you go into Africa, uh, where uh, uh, Zambia is a major producer, they have significant problems with respect to production. I think that copper issue is, a, is going to be a, a big, big uh, uh, player uh, going forward. Uh, I would say even more than what we're seeing with lithium right now. Lithium is having its day right now, but I think that the story, the big story is copper. So you think supply tightness throughout this year? Uh, Our inventories of copper now? Fairly fairly uh, soon, uh, actually. And yeah, this year and, and in the short term. What If we think about you know China switching back on, yeah, Xi's pivot away from um, the COVID lockdown policy, that industrial output, how does that impact, impact copper and the other base metals? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good point because China was the big driver for copper prices. So goes China, so goes uh, copper. And you have to remember, copper, like uh, iron or steel, uh, were the two principal uh, industrial drivers. So you just look at GDP and so goes copper, so goes steel, which is iron ore. And now the new thing that has happened is that copper is not just the old grandmother's industrial player. Uh, it's uh, Copper now is new energy. Copper is for charging stations. And and the Chinese, uh, uh, if uh, the, the last uh, suggestions I heard of growth 
we're talking about they were talking about three percent but i i've seen numbers as much as five percent in this environment five percent growth is a lot and so again there would be huge demand for copper yep. uh from from the chinese just driving that uh supply chain issue yep i think everyone's probably in agreement yeah to be bullish on china but roger you wanted to chime in that Sure. I was just going to add kind of there, there are two ideas being talked about here. One is the price of the commodity and the other is the access to the commodity. Yeah. And, and, and they're, they are different. The, the price of the commodity is a function of short term factors and coincident demand, the strength of the industrial economy, the strength of these, you know, Europe, yeah, US. Um, but access is a whole different story. And, and, uh, Dan and Keith talked about it, but the, this reshoring deglobalization trend is fundamental to the energy transition. And China exists in a universe by itself. China is um, building out one belt, one road, is building a whole supply chain that will be beholden to it, may, may well pay an RMB for these commodities. Uh, but if you are a Western European company that is going to make something to do with electric vehicles or batteries, um, or you're a North American company, you're going to want that supply chain to be as close to where you can control it as possible. And um, what that means is that the asset value of resources uh, in developed markets uh, are definitely going to trade at a premium to those in, in other places. And the price of copper doesn't really matter if you don't have access to the resource to build what you need. Yep. Justin, do you have a view on that, on that access side of things as a P? Maybe you've got more uh, agility in there in terms of where you can get into, what markets you can get into and operate and, and, and invest? For sure. Um, and I, I think with copper specifically, and, and for, for reasons that both Keith and Roger started to dive into, I mean, the cupboard is relatively bare. Um, and, and for a number of reasons, including, you know, uh, primarily ESG driven, um, permitting timelines have, have just completely blown out. You know, in many cases, it takes four or five years just to permit a project after you fully de-risked it. And the de-risking process itself can take upwards of 10 years. And so there's no ability to turn on the cat on the taps and mobilize new copper supply. Um, and so really the only hope I think for bringing on new copper in the near term is higher incentive prices to unlock some of the large low grade copper porphyries that have been de-risked have been sitting on the shelf for a long time. Um, but otherwise, I think it's going to be a, a really painful period as we try and de-risk new supply. Um, I think another thing really impacting that is just, uh, and, and Roger mentioned this, that the company's mandates have been to return capital over the last 10 years. And so companies have seriously, serially underinvested in exploration, mm. um, meaning outside of the, you know, few development projects that are maybe shovel ready. Mm. There just really isn't much behind it. Yep. It's interesting. And, you know, I, I think from the market perspective on the returning capital, people have seen what's happened to the energy companies and the energy companies stopped investing and those stocks have done very well. Mining stocks have not done well for a number of reasons, but I think those who did return capital, the bigger cap guys saw a benefit from returning that capital. And so they pull back CapEx. Uh, but anyway, for it, when you think about commodities, always remember there's an axiom that's, you know, the solve for price and commodities is the price and commodities, meaning the price, you know, always gets reaction and gets you to do something and act in a certain way. And so prices will fix it, but it's going to take higher prices to fix this. And people are going to have to realize that, um, you know, the, the same thing for rare earths. I, I've not a big believer in, in, in rare earths and somebody here in the rare earths company, I, I apologize. But they're, they're not rare. They're uneconomic earths. <laughs> they're, they're rare because they're little tiny pieces and specks within them. And they're very hard to produce, very hard to get out to, to process. So they're uneconomic and that's why they're rare. But once they become economic, when the prices rise enough, you can actually start processing them. And there's tons of them and lithium is going to find the same thing. There's tons of lithium out there. It is the hottest play going. Everybody is running around trying to grab a lithium asset. I'm busy looking on our greenstone belt to see if we can find some, some, some type of sign there so I can change the name to lithium as well. Just that's, that's probably worth 20 multiple points. You know, just by getting that, it doesn't mean that it's actually a producible amount of lithium, but if I can get the name in there somehow in a press release, I'm sure I can raise a hundred million bucks on that somehow. But 
but that's but that's the hot thing. And lithium is critical. It is important now. But you also have to remember there's tons of it. You can go down to Bolivia and sweep the salt flats and get, but it takes a lot of money to clean it to get a, a pristine product out there. So it's going to take a lot higher prices, which is good for investors, good for stocks to solve these problems. But these problems will get solved. And they actually, those higher prices will also push back on those permitting issues. Toronto or Ontario and the minister now is getting very aggressive in trying to solve some of these problems to speed mining up and solve some of these permitting things because they're seeing the problem coming. That's not going to get solved overnight. These are long trends that take forever and they don't help next quarter's returns. But it, it is something people are getting more and more attuned to and pushing back on some of the other things, which is good. Can I just chuck in there that, yeah, um, you know, haven't we had some incentive pricing kick in over the last 20, uh, last couple of years, you know, since, um, 2020, uh, and the pandemic. And so sort of we've, we've spoken of being in a super cycle or at least a structural long term bull market on metals. Um, shouldn't some of that incentive pricing already have happened and you know new capital come be coming into the sector already we've got things like the inflation reduction bill that granted probably doesn't touch upstream like uh, the mining equities yet um, but it certainly hits the components that need those metals you know in terms of uh, wind turbines or whatever it may be um just throwing this back at you as a devil's advocate are we not seeing enough yet it, has it, have we not seen some sort of positive not a, not if capital own, coming into this <laughs> not if you own mining stocks i mean that, i think that's the 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 simple truth is yes there's been price benefit gold price is high but the gold stocks are down yep. uh the the benefit has not come through to that partly it is inflation it is higher to get things out of the ground so there has been some impact to earnings, but okay. no, because they're all chasing growth things and you are not allowed in your portfolio. You're, you're evil if you own Glencore, BHP, Rio, just picking off the biggest names yeah. and bigs. You have that in your portfolio. You suffer from investor scrutiny and it's easier not to have it and have an underperformed and to have it and take a beating. Just on that point, I don't yeah, want to forget that point. That's a, a really key point. Uh, gold, gold equities are underperforming in a time they should be performing. Mm. And it's because the money is going after critical minerals and, and the sexy uh, lithium, uh, yeah. et cetera. And, uh, one of the things that we have, you know, if you look at all the factors that drive gold inflation, uh, the U.S. dollar, uh, you know, uncertainty, issues, yeah. you can go through the bank, the bank financial crisis. Those are things that normally would drive gold uh, to the roof mm -hmm. and gold commodities perform in a bit, but equities... They take time. The historically, equities kick a bit off. They, they, the they, they, they know, lag, they lag. Okay. But, but in this case, the, because the demand is so much, and I've talked uh, just in Miami recently, we we're talking about that, is that uh, the, the all the gold companies, the exploration companies now, uh, are getting uh, a shitty uh, lithium project. It doesn't matter. If you have a lithium project in your portfolio, uh, then uh, you can get your gold prices uh, your gold equity is up. Yep. Interesting. Roger, you had some points. Yeah, I was, so we've seen this before. Um, I've been a global equity investor for more than 25 years. Um, I've lived in San Francisco for more than 25 years. In 1999, uh, there was a, a tech boom where pets.com was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And everybody thought the world was going to be completely reinvented around a whole series of new ideas enabled by the internet. And, um, and then that got debunked. And between 2002 and 2008, the financial crisis, you could have put all of your capital into mining companies, and that would have been by far the best thing you could have done. Incredible boom. And I would say today looks exactly like 2002, where everybody's been on one side of the boat. You know, there are five companies that have been running the S&P for the last 10 years, and people think that they can do no wrong, and they're highly valued. But the point that I would make is why, why, why are gold companies not trading up? Why are copper companies not trading up? Is I've been a global equity investor since 1997. You know, I've, I've been on the ground in the Arctic and Mongolia and Chile, all these places. Every single person I know who's a mining analyst no longer works in the industry. They all, they all lost their jobs. 
There, there are no buyers. There's no specialty knowledge to invest in any of this stuff. And so, you know, I've been in a lot of, a lot of rooms with a lot of investors and everybody's in a froth about lithium. And if you talk to a younger investor, present company excluded, they, um, you know, they know about the one thing that is hot, but they don't know anything about anything else. Right. And so I think the real reason that the stocks haven't started working yet is that these companies have been so marginalized and their weight in the indices is so small that investors don't need to have anybody on staff who knows anything about this stuff. You know, and if you listen to Jeff Curry, who's Goldman Sachs mm -hmm. commodity analyst, who actually is the last man standing still around, um, you know, he, he'd tell you he thinks that the mining weight within the S&P is going to triple or quad quadruple. And, and I would say I, I agree with that. And that's a combination of this asset class being revalued, but the, the other stuff's going to get revalued the other way, right? And so to Dan's point, I don't want to say it's easy to beat the index, but when the index has been lopsided for a long period of time and everybody believes that there's a group of companies that can do no wrong, uh, that that sets up pretty well for active investors. Fantastic. So we're at a point of pretty low valuations relative to the value of these businesses, you know, here and around us, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, just a comment. I, I want to delve a bit more on yeah, valuations. Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, yeah, these companies are cheap. Uh, you know, we have a very specific strategy. We focus on um, companies that are changing their business models and are going to be perceived differently in the future. So I'll give you one example. We own a company called uh, Fortescue uh, Metals Group. It's an Australian iron ore producer. It's the fourth largest iron ore company in the world behind Valley BHP and Rio. And uh, these guys sell primarily to the Chinese and the Koreans and, and to Japanese steel mills. They take a commodity uh, price that is negotiated, but there's a market indication. And, and that company trades at a 20% free cash yield. That, that's incredibly cheap stock. Um, because everybody thinks that something's about to roll over. It's a cyclical stock, right? They've put... They put a billion dollars last year into a new hydrogen unit that they're creating called Fortescue Future Industries. Mm -hmm. They are attempting to build out what they believe will be a merchant business for global green hydrogen. And uh, they've, they've put about a billion five into that business. It employs 1,500 people. Uh, there is zero value in the stock for, for that. You get that for free. Our, our view and our thesis, the way that we approach these markets is the day that company hatches something on the other side of the business, you know, the business doubles or triples in value. People see something that they didn't see before. So here's an example of a company in a legacy cyclical business that has no investor sponsorship. You know, a Australian entrepreneur controlling shareholder who went bust on his first deal and now is doing well. Um, but I think a lot of the mining industry looks like that where you have a very, very limited investor audience and people have not yet fully calibrated that you can't, you can't build the electrified economy without copper, without nickel. Uh, yeah, Justin, where do you sit on the valuations at the moment as private equity viewer? You know, is this the time to sort of jump in? You guys have been active in the space for so long, um, but yeah, what about opportunity now and amongst the sort of tiers of mining companies? It's actually a great question, and I think um, for us, we're, we're we're very fortunate where mining companies are unfortunate because we invest at the bottom of that part of the Lausanne curve uh, when when companies are typically in the orphan phase. Um, and, and so, and, and the issue that the other guys have, have all mentioned on the panel is just that with a, a lack of kind of generalist interest in the space or, or just any interest in the space, there's no real public equity available for these companies to, to go out and, and raise the capital to build their mines. Sure, there might be some, some debt available from the government or grant money, uh, but that's only part of the puzzle. Mm. And so for us, uh, we're very privileged to get to invest in a, at a point in time and in a part of the space where it's almost kind of valuation valuation agnostic because it's just that everything is very cheap. And so it's about finding the best projects at that stage and then putting capital to work. Yep. Yep. Excellent. And, and maybe just to add, it, the, the mining uh, insight and talent as it exists today is largely in the private equity community, which is interesting, right? The, the opportunity is accru accruing to you to your asset class yep. and the public market investors are going to have to wait. Is this something about how private equity uh, remunerate their teams and their stocks? <laughs> I, I don't think it's, that's necessarily, I mean, sorry, I, I get paid a very fair wage, but um, no, but in all seriousness, I think, um, you know, mining private equity, 
you know, we, we are kind of the only game in town in some respect at, at this point. Um, but we're still a very nascent industry. I mean, you can count the number of mining PE sponsors on two hands, um, which is, you know, a far cry from where oil and gas, uh, you know, was, uh, previously, I mean, they, they were probably, you know, 10 to 20 times the size of mining private equity. Mm. Um, and so I think it's, you know, that lack of interest that we see in the public markets also still extends to the LP community are the people who invest in our funds. Mm. And so a big part of our job is when we're out talking to pension plans and endowments is trying to educate them on things like the energy transition and, and the mining sector and why this is important and why we should be a part of their portfolios. Is, is there more incentive for that now though? Are they coming to you and saying, you know, tell me more about this, these strategic minerals in this energy transition piece, you know? So it's, 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 it's super interesting. So I've been with Denim uh, in two separate stints. I've been with the company though, roughly for almost 10 years now uh, over the two, two separate stints. And so when, when I first joined the firm, we we're out raising our first dedicated mining fund. Um, and it was a really interesting time because when we were out talking to, to prospective LPs, um, it was a two-step process. So one, you actually had to educate them on the mining sector because they weren't very familiar with it. And then two, uh, you had to convince them that they want, whether or not they wanted to invest with you. Mm. And so that was a really long life cycle kind of gestation process. Um, since I've been back with the firm in my, my second term, um, when we go see LPs now, everybody is aware of the energy transition. Um, they understand that these critical metals and minerals are, are absolutely required for, for what we're trying to achieve. Um, and so now, you know, they often have dedicated people looking at the space. Um, and so really now it's just a question of, um, who they want to park or who they want to invest their capital with, which I find really encouraging because it means that people are finally starting to take notice of the importance of these upstream metals and minerals that are required for the transition. Yeah, the hard part of that is is just the the time. You know, PE investors are used to SaaS startups, you know, software startups, something, and you can get something from idea generation to cash flow in three four years. You have liquidity event in fifth year, seventh year. You just can't do that in mining space because you have idea generation, seven years of discovery, five years of permitting, and three years of build. And those timelines are so hard. So it has to be a different mindset in the PE. And it's very hard to make that work. It is working, starting to work because I see it, but it, it's just not as simple. I always equate mines to like biotech companies and you have phase one, phase two, phase three, mm -hmm. and your cash burn is accelerating through that. But there's uncertainty. But as you're taking out risk to phase three, your cash burn goes up monstrously. Yep. And how do you get to the capital of that? They're very similar, but in the U S we've always had a very, robust PEVC funding of biotechs because it's interesting. It takes the same amount of time, even higher risk, I think, even more failure. It's like one to a thousand compounds from discovery to actually getting in production for a drug company. Mm. But because it's more tangible and healthy and it, it seems to get that money, we've never been able to generate that. We need to generate that in the mining space somehow. I think that'd be very, very beneficial. Yep. Do you think the midstream processing industrial part would help help that in that respect so all that comes so late from it and trying and survival to that period makes it very so you you know you we need to bring in i have to bring in a partner so for my little thing i need to bring in partners now to come in just for getting to the resource stage getting to that next and they need to be a partner with you all the way through because you don't want them liquidating when you're coming to that so by the time i get to mine build you know they've they've had to participate in several rounds so it becomes tiresome. That's the other problem with the mining space. It becomes tiresome for investors getting to that end. And then their, their constraints change. The market changes. Their bosses change. Their directives change. Mm. Uh, it is, it is a very difficult world. Yeah. I want to, I want to probe into just a, a point that you sort of raised on in the, in the initial comments as well as Roger, I think touched on and everyone, of course, can comment, but it's around sort of the oil and gas companies being considered growth companies. And then, uh, Roger, how you're sort of seeing uh, a sort of an alternative view to energy transition with these energy companies and how they might be, you know, or are going to be part of the solution really in the long run. They've got the skills, innovation, capital, the underinvestment story is well, well explained um, so far. But the oil majors and the mining majors, you know, what are they going to do? Um, or what do you see as their key role um, in this narrative that we've been talking about? Sure. Well, I I think what I'd say first is the capital cycle for the energy transition is the largest the world has ever seen by, by a multiple. So think of this as industrial revolution 2.0. We're going to try to 
overhaul about 20% of the global economy that, that, that powers the global economy. And that is, in essence, is a transition from fossil fuels to electrification. And that reduces demand for all things kind of CO2 emitting and increases demand for everything that enables electrification. And, um, you know, we have, as a society, we've transitioned twice before. Um, we use wood until about the late 1800s, and then coal was discovered, and coal was higher energy density and more practical, and coal was the world's dominant fuel until 1950, like really not that long ago. And then oil, which you could carry around and work for transport, became the leading source. So now we're going to try and turn all that off and move to something else. And, you know, that... Uh, the, the group of the people who I interact with every day understand that this is the this is the biggest show in the world, and governments are throwing money at it. Governments are competing to give capital to the companies in these areas, right? And at a time when the economy is slowing and interest rates are rising, and people are getting laid off. Here's an area where the governments are competing to give you capital and incentives to be in the business. This is, and so you have very high certainty of growth. And then you have a group of companies that have been re viewed historically either as cyclical or low growth are about to become very high growth, high structural growth. So I'll just give you one example. So, um, Baker Hughes is an oil service company. Okay. Baker Hughes, uh, is an American company. Uh, its biggest knowledge center is in Florence, Italy. It's got global operations. It's got customers around the world. These guys are experts at handling gases and, and fluids. Um, ba the origin of Baker Hughes, but it was the GE aircraft engine on the ground. How, how can I use it? I can use it to generate power. These guys have 3,000 compressor customers globally and see each of them as a potential hydrogen customer. So they have a step out business with a technology that they know everything about, with a group of customers that they already have, with the manufacturing capability and technical skills. And this company historically trades at a low multiple because it's cyclical, oil service spending goes up and down. And it is going to evolve into something that has high structural growth as far as you can see. And so, so for the metals companies that, you know, the audience here, this, these assets will largely be consolidated by people who have large structural plans, uh, and, and need security of, of supply. Uh, and, uh, I, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll stop. Uh, and yeah. an interest, a very interesting point with respect to the, the oil and gas companies. What I'm seeing is a lot of the, these oil and gas companies, I'm getting calls all the time uh, from uh, Texas-based companies. There's gold in them, there are hills, and I want to get in. They, they have the skill set that is necessary for uh, uh, extracting uh, uh, metals. You know, the, the metal and the oil and gas industry are similar. They, they drill, they take stuff out of the ground. One is a liquid, one is a solid. They're different in many ways, but they're quite similar. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you see a lot of oil and gas companies looking to diversify into the, the mining space. I, I, I was just in uh, Riyadh in Saudi Arabia uh, a couple of months ago, and Saudi Arabia has made a strategic decision. They, they actually put in $50 billion in the mining space. Uh, uh, they've made a strategic decision to go into the, the mining space because we're the largest oil producer in the world. We have the largest reserves. People might argue it's Venezuela or it's in some cases Canada with the tar sands. But let's assume Saudi Arabia is the largest uh, uh, reserve and producer in the world. And w my business is going to be dead in 50 years. What 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 else can I do? And they've decided that it's the metals industry that is the growth industry where that they, they're going to diversify into. I could see a lot of oil and gas companies making that same decision. Yep. We've got four minutes. Does anyone want to throw a question out to our panelists while we've got everyone on stage? And we've got a query about something we've had so far. Yeah, gentleman at the back. Yeah, that, that's a, a midstream piece. Yeah, it just uh, just that that's a very good point. Uh, that is the processing of of these metals 
is a, is a area that has been left for China, and and uh, most of the the upstream uh, aspects of mining have been handled by the, the major countries, Canada, Australia, etc. But the downstream and the midstream have been left for others. And I think this is one of the big changes you would find. And I, I know in, in Canada, for example, there's a big emphasis the government is pushing to, to reshore and bring back uh, uh, processing. The problem with processing is that it's dirty. Uh, and, and China didn't mind uh, the, the environmental issues. But one of the things that we have to accept here in North America is that if you start processing, you have to accept some, uh, of course it will be done with ESG principles, but you have to accept some measure uh, of environmental uh, issues. Uh, you, there's no processing without some uh, environmental issues. Yep. It's also one of the battles facing a lot of companies with the countries, Indonesia, Chile, and other places, Congo, Zimbabwe tried to do it, is they want to force you to process at home, but companies don't want to do it because it allow, that allows them to then come in and take your asset once you have built it. And they're always worried about that in places where politics change. If you provide them all the capacity and everything to do it, you, you sink all the capital and they just come and take it from you. And so that's one of the reasons they've always tried to process offshore in other places. Uh, but that's also why Indonesia is pushing hard to get nickel and others and why they had the big battle of Freeport over the Grassberg mine about processing in country. So that, that is going to be a battlefield of where it does, but a lot of capital needs to be invested to, to get that done. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to sort of the incentive pricing just very quickly and get the panel's view on what, what is going to be the new level of incentive pricing that's going to kick capital and all this uh, attraction back to the sector. Um, um, are we going to see it quite soon as well? I, I would say we already saw it a bit, um, you know, when copper spiked pretty good before, and that was starting to stimulate. Now that's fallen back because the work the China economy, but now it's China is coming back on. You should get that, but you get, you start getting copper back up there again, but it, it takes seven years and Freeport said that we have mine trade to go, but it'll be seven years before we can bring that capacity to market. So you're going to zoom past that stimulus price to a panic price or a pain point, and then you'll settle back at what is a reasonable in investment level. You know, at gold at two thousand, you know that's that's sustainable. Oil is going to be close to triple digits again. We're under investing. We don't have enough refining capacity. That's the biggest problem here that people don't realize uh, that refining has collapsed in the oil and gas space. And so we're going to be short there again. Uh, and then I think we're already seeing that in some of the other spaces, lithium. You, so much capital is coming to lithium. You would say we've seen that price because look how much capital is coming into it. So the capital flowing into it is what tells you what it is. Yep. One other comment I want to make to, to Roger's point about the you know that last decade and how good that last decade was. You know, you know, from the internet bubble to the financial crisis, uh, the fun I ran, not by my charm or good looks or anything, is probably more by, is definitely by market, you know, returned 28% a year for that decade. So I think that's kind of what you could be looking at in terms of when you talk about a good time and something good happening that he's talking about, that's what the average annual return was for a decade in the mining space. That's a pretty good decade. It's painful since then, but uh, that decade was pretty dang good. Okay. Well, it's going to come again. Yep. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Number four? Yeah. Well, the, big, the big picture, where are we at now? It's sounding like uh, fossil fuels is the, is the best opportunity right now. Even better than gold and silver. In the near term, perhaps. Yeah. Resources all together, which is the best. I, <clears throat> I, I, I don't, you know, I don't know that it's possible to, to judge one against the other. Fossil fuels are a coincident indicator of economic health, right? And so the oil price was higher. It was, it was over 100 bucks, wasn't it? Now it's back in like the, the mid-70s. I, I don't know that I would say the fossil fuels are the sure bet. I, I'd say copper is the commodity that is most required and the lead time to deliver scale 
is quite long and mainstream investors are going to invest in, in that commodity. I, I think, you know, we, for, for, so in our fund, we have, we have four different commodity companies. We own equities. One's an iron ore company, but it's got this big hydrogen business. One is an aluminum company, Norse Kidro, which has hydropower, super cheap, fixed input costs, which its competition doesn't. One makes uranium, Cameco. That, that, that commodity to me looks very attractive long term. Yeah. And the fourth is a copper company. Yeah. Let's just quickly round up because we're pretty much out of time now. Dan, hot commodity this year, would you agree? Copper or? Well, I think copper is dependent upon the economy. And so copper is the most needed, but trying to marry the timing that it happens and the timing of the economy is what becomes difficult. Yep. Uh, gold, I think, uh, gold companies need to catch up. Their stocks need to catch up to the price uh, for that. Yep. The, these long run, sorry, these long run theories are not theories, they're the happenings. It takes a long time to marry a long term trend to what's happening in daily prices. And the copper and every commodity gets buffered around by what happens, as everybody said, in the market. So I think that's what makes it tough on predicting the when. We know what the what is. We just don't know when the what's going to happen. Yep. Keith, uh, just quickly. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, quickly, I, I'll say three. I can't say one. Go. Uh, copper, for the reasons we've described. Lithium, I think there's still yep. a lot of um, uh, road for, for, for lithium. So lithium will continue at least in the short term. And uh, gold, surprisingly, gold will come back. Yep. Uh, if you look at the macros, uh, gold. And uh, uh, something we haven't talked a lot about, but the other big uh, player besides uh, copper is nickel. Mm. And nickel is about to take off. Yep. Justin, you didn't give a... Any any commodities there? I'd put you on the spot. Uh, perfect. Uh, so so I think I'll, I'll I mean copper uh, absolutely, but I think I'll go a little bit off piste and just say I, I think metallurgical coal is something that mm -hmm. continues to be overlooked. I mean coal is actually a four letter word, but it's treated like a four letter word in the markets. Um, you can't have your wind turbines or solar panels without metallurgical coal, which is a key input in steel. Um, and with companies divesting, companies shuttering assets. The market basically treating it like it's it's toxic waste. Um, there's just going to be serial underinvested uh, investment in metal and thermal coal going forward, and I think both of those commodities will outperform. Fantastic! Well, excellent. We've pretty much covered a lot there. Hope everyone enjoyed that, and round of applause for the panel. Very much. Nice.